Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Tech Guys to Invest podcast. And this week, we have Bill McCafferty. He is a full-time asset manager, primarily investing in second position notes. And if you follow him on social media and YouTube, which will give you the information later, he talks a lot about mindset. So, you know, Adam and I are going to talk about that also. Welcome, Bill. Nah, thank you, guys. I'm looking forward to being on here and, uh, you know, telling you a little bit about my story and discussing the business. Awesome. We're glad to have you. So, Bill, I want to kick it off with the first question we, we have for you here, which is, uh, we know you're a, a note investor, and uh, we'd like to know the main differences between first position note investing and second position note investing. Absolutely. So, my full concentration is, uh, you know, non-performing and re-performing second mortgage notes. Uh, definitely do a little bit with uh, non-performing first mortgages. Um, but the biggest difference, in my opinion, um, especially managing the asset, is with uh, non-performing first, you, most of your exits are going to be through the property, meaning you're going to foreclose on the property. You're going to liquidate it by selling it after the sheriff sale. You know, maybe you get creative and sell it on terms. A majority of your exits, you're going to be exiting through the property. With non-performing seconds, majority of your exits are going to be through the homeowner, which means you're going to work it out on terms with them. They're going to get put into a loan modification and start paying you, uh, maybe a discounted payoff. You know, there are times that you exit through the property, but majority of the time, I always say with seconds, it's 80% through the homeowner, 20% through the property. With first mortgages, it's flip-flop, 20% through the homeowner, 80% through the property. Now, as an asset manager, that is the biggest difference. Um, you know, as an investor, uh, you know, clearly when you're investing in non-performing seconds, you're behind a, a first mortgage. So, you know, everything kind of needs to go correctly with that first mortgage in, for, in order for your second to kind of be put in a good position to kind of survive. Um, you know, I know uh, we like we were just talking about, um, you know, mentor of mine, uh, Dave Van Horn was on one of your podcasts recently. I know Dave discussed it a little bit. Um, you know, capital wise, um, you know, purchase price are different on them. Okay. Uh, you know, and when you're dealing with non-performing first, you know, you could be dealing with, you know, smaller properties, um, but you can also be dealing with more expensive properties. No different than with seconds. Um, you know, you could be dealing with delinquent seconds on, small value properties, you know, all the way up to million dollar properties. So I think the main difference that I wanted to get across is what I said about the exits. Okay. So Bill, um, quick follow up on that for some uh, listeners who may not be familiar with non-performing and performing. Can you just explain what that means? Nah, absolutely. So when a homeowner, a borrower takes out a loan from a bank, um, it's considered a performing loan as they start paying on that loan and as they continue to pay on it. When that loan goes 90 days delinquent, meaning the homeowner stopped paying on that loan uh, for 90 days, um, it's considered a non-performing loan. You know, a lot of these non-performing loans that we end up with could be anywhere from 90 days, you know, all the way out to five years, you know, maybe sometimes even longer. Wow. Uh, meaning the homeowner's not paying on them. Wow. Okay. When That's I, a long time. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's, you know, especially since we move away from the market crash um, of 07 and 08, you know, a lot of the stuff has already kind of been put out onto the marketplace, but there's still stuff that we're seeing now from, you know, 2011, 2012, uh, before I got on the, uh, call tonight. I uh, was putting a loan modification together and the last payment from that bar was 2012. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, it happens. Wow. So, and then when I use the term uh, reperforming, that is a loan that was performing. It then went non-performing and then we did a loan modification on it and it's now reperforming. Interesting. Well, thank you for that breakdown. And just a curiosity question, as far as those non-performing, performing, reperforming. And the market today, I'm assuming you get, you, you look at and analyze a ton of, of second position notes. What would you say is the spread? Are you seeing a majority of re-performing, a majority of non-performing? 
what are you coming across? Uh, I mean, a little bit of everything. You know, I have two companies. Um, I have an asset management company. And that asset management company manages non-performing loans uh, for different investors. Gotcha. So investor, investors buy the loan and hire me to manage the asset, uh, the bar, the attorneys, the foreclosure process. So in that portfolio, it, I, all I deal with are non-performings. Okay. Um, you know, I get them re-performing or maybe get some payoffs and I deal with everything um, in between in that portfolio. And then in my own portfolio, uh, I do both. I buy non-performing and I buy re-performing. Um, you know, over the last few years, uh, pricing has been up on non-performing loans. Mm -hmm. so, when you, so when you buy a non-performing second, uh, you're buying it based off of a percentage of the, the loan's unpaid principal balance. And what, dic what dictates that is uh, the currency of the first mortgage, uh, the equity in the property, uh, the state. They're the three main factors um, on when you purchase a non-performing second mortgage. Okay. Like I said, it's, it's based on the percentage. When you buy a re-performing second, um, it's based off the yield that you want. Now you have to, you know, negotiate with a note seller, but it's not based on a percentage of the loan balance. It's based on the yield of what that note would pay out over time. Um, you know, still different variables, what state it's in, uh, the payment history, the seasoning in it, um, you know, the equity in the property. So over the last three years, I personally have probably bought more re-performing uh, second mortgages than non-performing in my own portfolio. Um, it's probably a combination of having more capital. Uh, but, you know, I'm getting good deals on these re-performers. You can position yourself around uh, hedge funds and different funds that need to liquidate because their funds are closing or they need to refuel with capital and you can mm -hmm. put yourself in a good spot to get good deals. And we're definitely in an up market where uh, some of these re-performers, uh, homeowners are refinancing you out, uh, which is nice. So that's kind of the, the difference um, between the two companies, even though I basically do the same thing. Um, okay. But I buy both. I buy both. Well, so good. Bill, one of the things you mentioned was loan modification, and I'm curious how that works. How does a, a loan modification work from, from your perspective as, a, as an investor, as a note investor? What does that look like? No, absolutely. Um, we call them loan modifications. We also call them workout agreements. Okay. Um, so if I'm working a non-performing loan for myself or for a client, uh, the main goal in the second space is to agree to new terms with the borrower. We really never want the property. Um, even if there's tons of equity in the property, that's not the goal. Um, that's not what I like to do. The reason I like this business is uh, I want to help a homeowner out. Uh, I want to put them into a, pay a payment plan, which is a loan modification. So um, somewhere along the process with these non-performing loans, um, and when I say the process, uh, we start the foreclosure process on pretty much all these loans. Okay. Um, you know, majority of the homeowners aren't going to want to just call you up and, and start paying you um, with phone calls and letters. It's just not the reality. <laughs> um, so the foreclosure process uh, gives you a little bit of leverage. Uh, it motivates the uh, homeowner to resolve it, gives them a timeline, a deadline. Um, so when they come out, um, I have a, a whole loss mitigation process that I put them through. Um, I supply them with a loss mitigation form that they need to fill out, uh, su supply some financial documents. And once they do that, I'll supply them with some payment options uh, based off what they owe. And when they choose a payment option, um, I create what I said is a loan modification. Uh, we also call them workout agreements. Uh, it's just a four page document. Uh, it references the original mortgage and note. So these documents don't get recorded. Um, and it just spells out all the new terms uh, that, we are, that we're going to agree on. Um, and that could be anywhere from, uh, you know, the loan balance to a sure. different interest rate to the, you know, maybe we shorten the years, maybe we extend the years, uh, the monthly payment, the late fee, um, how we're going to address the back payments. Um, we call those arrearage. So the arrears are the owed interest. 
uh, the late fees and uh, any uh, recoverable uh, foreclosure attorney fees. So okay. That's what, a loan, that's what a loan modification is. Interesting. So to back that up, just to make sure that our listeners understand, because you are the bank and because they have defaulted, meaning they breached the contract originally, you buying that second position mortgage can say, look, I'm, I am now the lender on this second position mortgage. Let's find a way that we can create some terms that are favorable for you so that you can still maintain, be in that house. And then I, I, as the investor can get paid. Is that a correct summation of that? Absolutely. You know, it all comes down to getting that homeowner to agree to something, make them comfortable. Cause if you want them, them to pay you for the next 10 to 15 years <laughs> or even longer, I mean, it's got to work. They got to feel like they got a good deal. Um, they got to feel happy with the situation to where a lot of investors go wrong. Um, sure. You know, they're, they're working out these things based off the yield and the results that they want. And it really comes down to what the, the homeowner wants. It's a win-win. You got it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, the, that's part, the game plan. The yeah, win-win. I like that. Best part so, of the business. Best part taking, of the business being the bank and controlling the paper like that. Absolutely. That's awesome. No toilets, no tenants, all paper and working with the borrower directly. Absolutely. No doubt. As an example, what would be, how could a homeowner who has a first position mortgage end up with a second position mortgage? Can we take a step back and explain that a little bit? Absolutely. So originally, uh, when the market first crashed in 07 and 08, a lot of these second mortgages were uh, what are called 80-20s or 90-10s. Uh, what that meant was a homeowner bought a house um, and it could be the same bank that did it. Uh, somebody lent them 80% on a first mortgage and 20% on a second mortgage. And that 100% combined was the purchase price on the uh, property. So they basically had two mortgages on the property. Okay. Uh, a first and a second. Like I said, a lot of these uh, were from the same bank. And uh, the reality is, is they did it to close the deal with no money out of the homeowner's pocket. Um, because technically, you know, the 80% first mortgage was saying a homeowner was going to put down 20%, but they ended up getting a second mortgage for that 20%. Interesting. So that's what, that's what started this whole thing. Um, now, after the market crash, and what we're seeing now are a lot of the second mortgages are uh, what we call home equity lines of credit. Those were taken out. Homeowner lived in a property. I actually have a line of credit out on my house. I bought a house. I bought it with one mortgage. Five, six years went by. I had equity in my property. I went to a bank who lent me on a second mortgage because of the equity above the first mortgage in between what the value of the house is. And I took out a line of credit. You know, a lot of these lines of credit are based off uh, interest only payments for a, a period. And then okay. they term out. But uh, that's it. I mean, there's really two types of second mortgages, either a fixed rate or a line of credit. So, Bill, as someone who doesn't invest in notes, I'm sitting here kind of wondering how you find these things. How do you find these, these types of products? Uh, it's a network relationship driven business, business. Um, just like any business when you get into it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the more work you put into it, um, there's a lot of conferences, um, you know, as you, and you guys know, as tech guys, social media, I mean, it's amazing what social media has done, um, for a lot of us to connect around the country. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, myself, um, as an asset manager, and then also as a note investor, um, I position myself around a lot of educators. I position myself around funds. Um, I call them the paper chasers, the people that <laughs> chase the paper. Like I chase it, but I don't need it as much as other people. So, you know, you find those people, um, you know, my asset management company, I've managed over a thousand uh, non-performing seconds. Wow. Um, at probably about 150, about 150 different investors over the last 10 years all those investors buy their own product and hire me to work it. I see where they're getting it. Um, so it's definitely just keeping your eyes open. Um, you know, the network is so powerful right now. It's such about the relationships. From the time I started this business in, in 08 
to about 2015, you could absolutely call up note sellers and get a spreadsheet and look at product and make offers. 2015 to now, it's not that easy. Um, there's a lot more people in the marketplace. There's a lot more funds that are holding their loans. I mean, you guys talked to Dave a week and a half ago, he, you know, them guys are holding a lot more than they did when they first got into the, the business. Yeah. They were doing, a, they were selling a lot. Now they're keeping everything. Um, so it's, it's that it's not easy. Um, it's definitely hard to get product. Um, but you know, there's plenty of people that are doing it full time and that are surviving. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, thank you for that summary. And, and going back to the second position mortgages, what would you say the, are the advantages and disadvantages of second position mortgages relative to other asset classes, maybe even first positions or buy and hold property? What would you say those would be? You know, when I first got into this business, um, I just, you know, I met the right guys at the right time that were buying seconds. I didn't even start with first. Um, oh, you you know, jumped what right I, in. Jumped right in. I mean, what I liked about it was a lot of people weren't doing it. Um, I liked the price point entry compared to everything else in real estate. Um, you know, clearly the market's a little different, but, you know, we started buying these things early on. I mean, you could get them really at a big discount. Um, I really enjoyed that. Like I said, there was really not a lot of competition early on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely more competition. Um, I like the ability to actually manage, uh, you know, right now I manage about 120 uh, non-performing seconds uh, for the asset management clients. And that's just me. I outsource a lot of different stuff, um, but I can manage those 120 loans from the, from my office in my house here. And they're, you know, they're probably in, you know, 25 different States throughout the country. There's right. no way that I could do manage 120 houses. Um, <laughs> across yeah. the country, let alone maybe even in my backyard. Um, so the ability to service is awesome. Uh, you know, they're kind of the advantages, um, you know, the upside on these things, you know, we really like the yield um, on some of the great deals. Now they all don't work out. Um, you know, if you're playing constant in the non-performing second space, uh, you're gonna, you know, strike out on some deals. Uh, there's a lot of different equity levels uh, when you buy these things and uh, sometimes they just don't work out. Uh, so, you know, I kind of went on a couple things there, but that's the, uh, that's what I like about it. Um, you know, I love the upside. Yeah, absolutely. So Bill, when you're looking at buying notes, um, is location use, is that something that you look for? And, and if so, what, what kind of markers do you look for when determining how good an area is to invest in? This is what's interesting about the second mortgage space is real estate is all about location. Mm. And I don't know if non-performing second mortgage investing is all about location. Interesting. Interesting. It's a, it's a really, really uh, cookie cutter business. Um, it's about the person inside the house um, and what they can do. It's, and it's not always about, what they do and, and piercing the, the brain and getting inside the homeowner, you know, some of these homeowners can get creative and maybe borrow some money from a friend or, you know, maybe they can access some public assistance and get you paid out. Um, I think location is a bonus, but I also think a lot of these uh, non-performing seconds, um, a big misconception on this is, you know, they're deadbeat borrowers or these non-performing seconds are on bad properties. It's not the truth. If you're able to get a second mortgage, it's most likely a decent property. Sure. And, and you were able to get two mortgages. Something just went wrong somewhere in your life. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's four of them. It's, you know, somebody died, medical, uh, job loss, divorce. Um, they're the four. So that's the reality um, with, with the seconds. Uh, you know, I think location is a bonus. Mm-hmm but you rarely end up with the property. Um, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen to actually end up with a property uh, from the non-performing second space. I mean, you got to foreclose, uh, you got to get the homeowner out of there. And if they're paying on the first, I mean, they're not going anywhere. They'll fight everything and eventually resolve it with you. Nice. So 
How does that work if you were to foreclose? Like, let's say you want to, you mentioned that you'll start the foreclosure process to at least uh, use that as leverage to, to the borrower and say, hey, look, I'm serious about that. If they know, if they're paying the first position mortgage, do you have to reach out to the first position? And how does that typically work when you do for, if you were to continue through the foreclosure process? No, absolutely. So when you're foreclosing, you know, you definitely, so all states are different, uh, but majority of the time you do need to, um, with your foreclosure documents, uh, notify the different uh, lien holders, no different than a first mortgage lender when they're foreclosing, uh, they need to notify other uh, lien holders. But I can actually foreclose from a second position subject to the first mortgage. And, you know, the first mortgage, as long as they're getting paid, I mean, they're not really going to do anything. Um, so when I say subject to, I can go through a, a second mortgage. I can go to sale for my second mortgage position and I don't have to pay off the first. Uh, the first has to be dealt with at some time. Um, and they can foreclose on, you know, like they can foreclose on a homeowner. They can foreclose on us. Right. Um, but nah, you know, that's some states have redemption periods that work a little different after a foreclosure sale. Uh, but you'd be surprised. Um, like the first mortgage won't have a conversation with a second mortgage without an authorization from the homeowner. Interesting. So when you're talking about you could foreclose subject to, does that mean you could foreclose on the borrower and then as long as the first mortgage, like let's say you foreclose on the borrower and then you put renters in that are paying that mortgage. Is, am I understanding that correctly? And then the first position still gets their money? Everything's got to work out and that first mortgage will have to accept that payment. Um, but I mean, I can tell you every type of story um, in this space. I mean, I've foreclosed on properties. Uh, I know people that have had them in rentals, paid on the mortgage paid off the whole entire first mortgage. Now they own the property free and clear. Um, so absolutely, that's how it works. Yep. Okay. That's interesting. It's almost like selling on terms. It really is, man. It's You, you kind of deal with everything in this business. And I think that's one of the main reasons I like it. There's always something going on new um, and it's it keeps it interesting. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's interesting. And, you know, one of the things that is also interesting to me, at least, is that you, you said it's about the person, you know, I mean, and, and that's cool. Kevin and I both are, are really people, people. <laughs> and so, you know, it's kind of neat to think about that aspect of it. Um, when, when you're looking at a second position note and you're thinking about investing in that, do you, do you try to understand who the person is uh, pretty early in the process or um, how does that kind of work out? What, what do you look for when you're trying to understand what you're about to invest in there? Now, I think every um, investor is definitely different um, on how they approach due diligence and what they're comfortable with. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, I've gotten so deep into this business that I, I'm probably not the best due diligence guy. <laughs> like I definitely put a lot of, I put a lot of trust in uh, the people I do business with. Uh, I put a lot of trust in my processes and systems. Sure. And I, and I just know the business works. Um, you know, long ago I found out that I didn't need to become the homeowner's financial advisor. I didn't need to know them inside and out. All I needed to do was have them make a second mortgage payment to me on a monthly basis and everybody's different and I can't figure everybody out. Um, you know, you definitely form relationships with homeowners, um, both with non-performing and re-performing. Um, there's, you know, plenty of homeowners that, that I kind of still communicate with at some degree, um, somewhere along the way, even after it's turned into a re-performing loan. Um, but you, you know, it's, it's how much you really want to dive into them. I mean, we can pull, um, I have access to a lot of different types of reports, uh, bar reports, property reports, uh, credit reports. Um, so you can get a really good read on what you're about to dive into. Um, but I always, you know, you definitely want to do your homework. You got to sure. know what you're doing. But I always say you can do too much due diligence because what I like about the second space is a lot of different things happen, you know, a homeowner, it may look like a bad situation, but maybe they, like I said, maybe they have a friend that could give them money to pay it off. Um, you know, we've had a lot of different uh, 
access to public assistance. Um, so there's just a lot of ways to exit these deals. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes as investors, uh, we overanalyze. That's fair. And, and we think we know everything. Um, and I just learned um, with the seconds, eventually it was more about my processes and my systems and controlling the emotional aspect of this business um, than really getting too deep into the homeowner's head, if that makes sense. Got it. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So you're looking for the story of the person as best as you can, but you're not also trying to go through analysis paralysis. That's it. Absolutely. And then we're thinking of, a, you mentioned one of the misconceptions that if somebody is a non-performing second, they're a deadbeat or something like that, or it's associated with a bad property. What other misconceptions do you think people have out there uh, that you have either never heard of second position notes or that are just familiar with it? And I think we, between investors, homeowners, mm -hmm. and even attorneys out there that say that a second mortgage can't foreclose on a property when a first mortgage is being paid on. Oh, that's a big Ma one. Yeah, major misconception. Hmm. Like I said, I mean, I deal with homeowners that say my attorney tells me you can't foreclose if I'm paying on my first mortgage. <laughs> Surprise. <No>? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest ones. Um, you know, the two that we just said about the properties not being in great condition um, or they're just bad people. I think there are the three big misconceptions in the second mortgage space. Um, and I don't know if this is really a misconception, but one of the biggest things people have a tough time with is, you know, you are behind a first mortgage. And as property investors, as investors, we want to control everything and be able to see the numbers and really be on top of it and mm -hmm. control everything at once. And with the seconds, it's, you're kind of controlling everything, but you're not, putting all that major pressure on and controlling it. There's some things that are out of your reach and you just have to be comfortable with it and see how it develops. Okay. Um, it, it's a big game of patience. Um, it, this business will test your patience all the time. Um, I think a lot of people um, that get into it, they see the dollar signs, they hear that it's a good business, but they don't give it enough time to work. Um, you know, I've seen plenty of uh, funds and I've seen plenty of investors come into my business and they're gone. Interesting. Um, they, they didn't handle it right. They weren't prepared for it. Uh, you know, I always say it's a three-year play. Um, you know, the funds always borrow money for three years. Um, if you're going to buy one note or a hundred notes, you have to let a three-year period go by to see how everything develops, how everything turns, um, and to really see a true uh, take on the business. And it may not be until that second, uh, that second phase of year four, five, and six for you to really start seeing profits and this thing taking off. Um, so I think a lot of, you know, I don't know if it's a misconception, but a lot of investors just, they chase the dollar and they don't ever give a true uh, business or niche in real estate a chance. Right. I like that, the patience aspect. And one thing you mentioned with the second position, you mentioned attorney a lot. Uh, my attorney said this, whether it's from the borrower perspective, from my experience and, and looking and learning about notes, you mentioned earlier that each state has a different, different laws. So how do you go about, or how would you recommend you know, newer investors figuring out the law? Not that you're trying to be a lawyer, but you know, finding the right attorney type of thing on your team. Uh, just what we were talking about earlier. Um, it's all about your network. Network. It's about relationships. Um, it's about putting yourself around the right people. Uh, you know, I know Dave talked about this, you know, when he was on, you know, find the people that are actually doing it. Right. Um, learn how to add value to them and try to pierce, pierce their network um, and, you know, get some help. I mean, this is a learn by doing business. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I worked at a school for 15 years before I dove into this whole niche of real estate. So, you know, the reason I figured it out is I just kept playing and networking and this attorney was no good. We moved on from him. Okay. We like this attorney. Uh, just kept building my processes and systems. And, uh, you know, right now, a lot of, a lot of your network and relationships can refer somebody to you. Um, but it was just all about, continuously learn by doing and, and putting yourself around the right people to 
get new sources. So nice. Bill, that's a good segue into something I wanted to ask you about next, which is um, how a person with a nine to five can get started in second position note investing. A lot of our listeners work uh, a nine to five, a uh, regular job, and they like their job. They don't necessarily want to quit. And, um, but at the same time, they're looking for ways to invest that doesn't involve putting their money into a 401k kind of a thing. Is that something they could do? Or is, is this more of a, it's really a business of its own. You're, you're more of an entrepreneur in this. What do you think? I think there's a lot of different phases and a lot of ways for people to get involved. I mean, you know, number one, this is not an easy business uh, to do full time. Um, you know, I'm very blessed. I'm very thankful. Um, but I, you know, I pat myself on the back for being in this business for over 10 years and surviving. It's, it's not easy to do full time, uh, but it's for everybody. I mean, it's a powerful business. I mean, maybe you want to buy a couple loans that are being paid on in your IRA. Maybe you want to just invest in a fund and take your eight to 10% return a month. Um, right. You know, I think there's so many degrees to be a passive and there's so many degrees to be an active investor in this business. Um, but you got to start out slow. Um, I think we all kind of uh, started out investing in a fund that we were comfortable with, like I did when I first started with uh, PPR way back in the day. Uh, saw that that was working, believed in the business. I uh, then turned around and bought my first reperforming second. Enjoyed the payments on that. Uh, then I went out and bought a non-performing second. Now that's a lot more work. Um, and they always don't work out. Um, but I think anybody um, at any level uh, wanting to do it full time, uh, somebody that's working in a nine to five job that just wants something different, um, you know, same here. I mean, I do this as a full time business, but all my IRAs, my health savings account, I mean, all my retirement stuff buys mortgage notes. So you, know, you are you the bank. You got it. So <laughs> you know, it's just like anything, you know, educate yourself, um, get out there, find the people that are doing it. Um, there's plenty of, uh, plenty of opportunity for people to get involved. Great. Awesome. And now we want to transition from, we talked a lot about investing and Adam and I are very passionate about having the, the correct mindset because we believe that your success as an investor is going to be a byproduct of, of your mindset to a very strong degree. And I know that you talk about it a lot on your YouTube channel, on Facebook as well. So how did you develop, I guess, this investor mindset or this passion for it at least? Nah, it's just, um, you know, it's just like everything that you do. Um, you, you know, you want to be better. Um, you know, it's absolutely about your mind. Um, you know, a lot of reading, a lot of research, um, you know, knowing where I'm going, knowing my why, um, I have two kids and a wife, um, you know, they need me to be good. Um, you know, life's not easy. Right. Um, you know, I have my good days and I have my bad days. Um, but I do know, you know, what needs to be done to be successful between mindset, um, a positive attitude and all the stuff that you need to do to be able to move forward and advance um, in business. Um, but it's so powerful. I mean, the right mindset will get you so much further than an incorrect mindset. So, Bill, how, how, do, you, um, how do you coach yourself through blockers, you know, things that are kind of slowing you down or, or obstacles to, to your success. And I absolutely, um, you know, I have my daily rituals. Um, I walk every day. Um, you know, when my anxieties, when my anxiety's going up, I know sometimes I need to get to my desk and I need to work it out. Um, and it's simple. I mean, I have two kids and a wife that need me. And, you know, anytime I'm feeling sorry for myself, I, I just remind myself, you know, who needs me, where I'm going with this. Um, so it's just that. It's, it's powerful. Yeah, it's coaching yourself. You know, as much as I love doing the, uh, you know, the videos and all the stuff out on, uh, on social media, it's also reminding myself on a daily basis, you know, what I need to do, what needs to be done. Because um, it's not easy. Agreed. Right. You yeah. Know, there's there's yeah. definitely a lot of walls you hit. Um, I deal with a lot of stressful homeowners. I deal with emotional investors. I deal with attorneys um, and I deal with my own head. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's just, uh, it's constant uh, reminding yourself, um, you know, where you're going and what your why is. 
Yeah, I think that you mentioned that a couple times, and and I totally agree with that. It's so important to understand your why, and and hearing you mention your your family and something like that that is just so meaningful or valuable to you just keeps you going. So that's good stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, not to get deep. I mean, it's about the time, right? The reason yeah. we do all of this, I mean, you know, you yeah. want to make the money, but the money buys you time to spend with your family and to spend with your why and to do what you want to do. Yeah, because we're not trying to trade our time for money. We're trying to buy assets that pay the money, right? Give us money. Give us That's time back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to put your time in and you got to figure it out. But, you know, there's only... Well, last question we want to ask you, Bill, is where can people find you? I am everywhere. I am on uh, Facebook. Um, I have a personal page, uh, Bill McCafferty. Page, Bill McCafferty. I also have a uh, business page called Note Fortunes. Uh, Note Fortunes is a second mortgage uh, education program uh, that I just launched a little while back. On LinkedIn. I have a Bill McCafferty page on LinkedIn. Um, under my LinkedIn profile, um, you can find the web pages for my education course. Um, I have a YouTube channel, Bill McCafferty. Free to email me. Uh, my email is uh, mortgage pay help. So mortgage, M O R T G A G E, pay, P A Y, help, H E L P. Um, they're the best ways to find me. Okay, great. And we'll put all that in the show notes so you can get to it conveniently. Bill, thanks so much for your time and thanks for coming on. I appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge with our listeners. It was awesome, guys. I really appreciate you reaching out. Uh, I love what you're doing. Um, I love the title of it. And, uh, <laughs> back on for anything. I would love to do it. Um, so thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Awesome guys.